Hey, everybody. So I have a great case study that I've been working on for the past couple of weeks because it involves an athlete that did not do as well as we wanted at his event. And sure, that happens a lot of times. But this was an event, a really long mega grand fondo, where there weren't necessarily tactics that were going to lead to failure. It was a big, pretty much physical competition. And we were shooting for a top 20. This athlete's a strong rider. And yes, if you know the Stelvio Grand Fondo, that's a stout ambition to have when there's over almost 500 riders. Uh, but he didn't reach that. And we were scratching our heads a little bit as to what had happened because we compared back to a different event the previous year. And I think this is a really good case study to look at to help us understand our own failures. So we have an unsatisfied athlete. We're gonna compare very basic, big picture. I, I hesitate to say this because it's big picture is not basic, but we're not gonna, we're gonna get granular on some things. And I think this is a good way, like, what do you look for? What do I look for? And I'd love to hear from other coaches in the comments because we actually have another coach that did a power file analysis, not from Evoke. And I got to see his notes and he's from Fast Talk. Um, I'm not gonna be doxing this athlete's name. I'm not gonna be posting the other coach's name. I think that just keeping to the data is the most important thing here. And then also getting granular enough where sometimes you just have a bad day, that's right. But I think you should want to dig into this. And this has taken me two weeks and it has taken a comment that you're gonna, when I heard, what he posted after a 10 hour gravel race, a huge light dawned on me. And I went back in and I think we found a big clue as to another reason why he didn't do as well as the year before. And then I also wanna talk about communication. I've mentioned this on the channel a billion times because communication is so important between you and your coach when you are, and I use myself as an example, when I was a self-coached athlete, Sometimes you set up your calendar and you find yourself slogging through workouts. There's no one to check in with. There's no one like, hey, should I be feeling this way? Maybe I should change things up. I have athletes that ask me, and this is not me pumping myself. I know my place in the pecking order of cycling performance, but I do think that I am very good at training. I'm very good at making who I am a better version of it. One reason I've just been doing this for a really long time. But people say, I don't get it. You always seem to be crushing workouts on Strava. The thing is, I only do workouts that are hard when I know I can do well. Now, I've posted other things where if I go out for a VO2 max day and there's a race coming up, like this is the only day that I'm going to do it because of the timing. And even if I fail, I fail. I fail workouts. It happens. But I also do as much as I can to prepare the schedule so that I am successful. And you need to communicate that with your coach. And this was a huge piece to us falling short. And I say us because when I initially saw the stats of the ride, I was like, hmm, that's initially the TSS was like, that doesn't seem as high as I thought it was. Like, I hope he didn't crater. And he was just bummed. And I hate that because I'm, yes, I'm a coach, but I'm an athlete first myself. And putting myself in that person's shoes, it just feels bad to not do well. And, you know, I, I do what I was saying before about these, these rides and races, I'm getting ready for amateur Nats. I feel physically ready to go. If a break gets away and I don't get in it, or I go and I attack and I get countered in the wrong move and the strategy is not together, then you got to get the timing right. Hey, that's just bike racing. But when I went to do, you know, a 350 mile gravel ride, if I can't complete it because I physically crumble, I'm, I'm going to scratch my head a little bit more like wondering like what went wrong? It wasn't tactics. Like I, did I eat right? Did I sleep well enough? What's the stress level? Da, da, da. So we'll get into that. So this is a long video because I want to get into this because I think there's a lot of things that you can pull from this as a self-coached athlete, which I, <laughs> it's very hard to get this granular on yourself, I think. So let's compare the two rides that we're going to talk about. The Stelvio Grand Fondo, which was 2022, which we were disappointed in, is 96.5 miles, 15,000 feet of climbing, took him just over seven hours, and 383 TSS climbing 
Uh, total average speed was 13.3. You know, I don't love average speed because there could be more tailwind, there could be more headwind, it could be rainy, but it gives us an idea of things. The other Grand Fondo in 2021 was 85 miles, so 10 miles shorter, but 1,000 more feet of climbing, 16,000 feet total. Average speed was slower by a mile per hour, 12.3, took him seven hours, so just about 15 minutes less, 440 TSS. That's 60 TSS more. He came in 157th place out of 1,100 riders last year. And spoiler alert, this year at Stelvio, did not get the top 20. He came in 41st. Now, when I first looked into the files, I was like, okay, what went wrong? He averaged 220 watts and he rode a lot more around 250 to 260. His FTP then, I think it was very similar. It's just over 300. And the interesting thing was he did have his heart rate was eight beats per minute higher, which could be so many things, but he had 45 minutes more of tempo. So climbing just, I mean, you all know if you climb mountains and you're climbing at endurance or you're climbing at tempo, but the interesting thing is he rode slower. So, you know, the, the elevation is the same. So we looked at the load going into these races and I'll post an image. He had more, a higher CTL, which CTL is not everything, but is about 10 points higher. He had a small gap in training, but that was back in February. I really don't think enough to make a big deal with it. His body could have been a little bit fresher, um, which could have contributed to the higher heart rate. But just the massive amount of more tempo ridden in 2021 was, uh, I was scratching my head at that. Oh, what about temperature? Temperatures were within like one degree Fahrenheit of the same. It did get hotter earlier this year, but I just don't think soon enough to explain the difference in power at our five and a half to seven. So it was interesting that he climbed a little bit faster with lower Watts. So, you know, I actually, in all my notes here, I don't know if I got the answer to this. Maybe he was more aero this year. He's a, another year, better cyclist. He's trained more. Um, could it also have been uh, more tailwind, more draft from other riders, but I don't know. There were less riders in this event, but it depends how many was he riding with. So it's about half the number of riders, 470 in the, the race this year. Altitude, this guy's in Europe. The races, this one seemed a little bit higher altitude. You know, in 2021, they're hitting four to 6,000 feet, but really only climbing around seven. Whereas the Stelvio, the whole second half is mostly above 5,000 feet where the power did start to fall off, which would be a factor. I mean, um, I actually don't know exactly what altitude he's at in Switzerland uh, when he's riding, but for me, and someone joked about this on Strava, when I go from Florida to North Carolina and start riding at four to 5,000 feet, I notice a difference. I can't initially do, I can't put out the same maximal aerobic power, aka VO2 max, 120% FTP. I can't ride at FTP as long. It takes me a few weeks to just turn over. I'm, I don't know, I'm a sensitive baby to altitude. And so who knows, everyone's gonna be different with that. Um, we talked about February. I can't see the small inconsistency playing a major factor. And then I won't get to what we initially, uh, what we learned just last week. So it took two weeks for that to come out in another ride file. So I just been, it's been driving me nuts. I'm looking through all these different things, looking at the, you know, he's trained more. He did have a little spike in training two times where the TSS three times, excuse me, where I think it was from the end of March and into early April, two big weeks, but then we had a rest week and he seemed to be doing okay. Um, I was getting the sense that he was a little bit more stressed this year, but even when and see the reason I'm having a hard time delivering this is because we had so many conversations going back and forth. I'm trying to get the to give you the chronological timeline in the best way without just reading uh, email threads. Training Peaks is not the Bible. You need to have fun riding your bike. 
I'll spoiler at one point, he says, I started to feel like I was slogging through some workouts. That is a red flag. If you are getting on your bike and thinking, I have to go do this, damn it. And not, yo, I can't wait to try and crush this four by 10. I'm going to go crush these three 20 minute segments of tempo. I'm going to be going so fast, man. I'm a little nervous for this VO two max workout, but I think I can freaking do it. And even if you fail, you know, you went to the plate, you gave your best and you're excited about the competition against yourself. Whereas when I've been burnt out, I'm like, Oh, I gotta go do this bike ride. Oh, I'm not gonna be able to put out these Watts. I feel weak. Those are massive red flags. You need to dial it down. You need to go back into endurance. You need to maybe cut some time. There's a lot of things that you need to look at sleep, stress, nutrition. If I'm stressed, my coach Landry has no idea if I just got, I'm doing a home, home renovation. He has no idea if I just got a bill for a lot of money because the carpenter stayed late. And it's like, whoa, dude, wait, this wasn't in the budget. And now I'm going to go try and do VO2 max. I'm looking at like, wait, we owe how, how many thousands of dollars more? Like, you are, you're not, that's not prepping me for a really hard bike ride. We're going to try. Remember these, some of these rides, we're trying to shift our physiology. We're trying to change our bodies by riding our bike at extreme high intensities. At times you need to be mentally with that. So this athlete in our emails, he said, dude, I've been trying to get my head around it. My working theory is that I reached a mental, uh, excuse me, a physical and mental saturation point. So I'm a fast talk member. So I had a coach take a look at the data to get a bit more perspective. The big bullet points that came out for him were mentally and physically. I got tempoed out. I got to a point where I wasn't enjoying, enjoying the workouts and rather I was just powering through. I should have communicated my mood to you. This is a great lesson to pay more attention to that. And if I notice a change, I need to flag it. Everyone rewind 15 seconds and just listen to what he said again. I talk to all my athletes and I'm, the numbers are important. I love the data. How do you feel? How are you feeling right now? Maybe we actually, today is a perfect example. Woman said, Hey, my crit might get rained out. What should I do instead of that? And I said, well, if you feel, I want to go to the crit for experience. I don't even care about the Watts right now. Cause she just crushed this race this past weekend. She got crushed and crushed did well in a time trial. Didn't do as great in a road race. This is going to be another podcast because the numbers are really interesting to look at versus other athletes that did do well. I said to her, if you feel recovered, we have a fart lit KOM, excuse me, QOM, queen of the mountain schedule for Thursday. If you feel good, go do that instead of the crit. If you're recovered well, if not ride endurance, just get back to a normal homeostasis. You need to be able to shift and be nimble. <clears throat> excuse me. The second bullet point that this athlete that we're talking about with the Grand Fondo had said, what about an additional transition week every three to four blocks of training so I can move away from structured workouts for another way to manage the fatigue and the load of training, <clears throat> excuse me, which I think is great. And we've talked about on the podcast before, if you're getting burnt out, say you're doing three, three weeks on one week off. You should not feel bad if you are getting burnt out at the end of the second week because you're in a real, you might have a race in five weeks and you're pouring it on a little bit before you do less intensity, probably keeping the hours up. You get to your third week of training before the rest week, and everyone, I shouldn't say everyone, a lot of people will be like, I got to get through this to get to the rest week. No, you don't. No, you don't have to totally flog yourself. You might do more damage flogging yourself and trying to like toughing it out than just dialing back to endurance and finishing the volume, but ride at endurance. Endurance is gold. Do that. And then these transition weeks ride by feel, you know, I think everybody should do this type of transition. I try to talk to people about after their last race, let's have some non-structured don't I want, I'm going to follow everything that you do and I'm going to make comments on your rides, but don't listen to me. Do what you want. What do you want to do? What's the group doing? What are your friends doing? You want to go like, and even in the middle of summer, I mean, I take, oh, I didn't do it this year because I was laughing at Chris. Cause like, dude, we, we've always been going somewhere for your birthday this year. What do we do? But we didn't leave without the bike. And I always joke because I'll take five days off and go do his birthday. Do I suck at the next race? hundred percent, but life, right? You got to pick and choose your battles. 
And then the third bullet point, this is going to be one thing we're going to talk about, reduce tempo in the weeks leading up to an event as we've been doing, keep a couple of the workouts with high intensity, but then let me stay at zone two. Otherwise, I think that could help me preserve some more freshness for the event. So we're going to look at that. Did he do, did I give him too much tempo? He also pointed out work got more stressful. It was more demanding. I had projects in my house that are around the house where I was doing really heavy yard work. And I was also getting a sense of guilt where I might not have as might not have been spending as much time with my family on the weekends while I'm doing these crazy long rides. I think many athletes, myself included, do not take into account that toll mentally and physically. It, when you want to be with your family and you also want to go do this long ride, sometimes it's really hard to choose and you choose the bike and you're out there and you're just thinking, I should be home with them. Maybe you should be home with them. Other times, uh, yeah, I'm, as an athlete and as a coach, maybe you need to try and stretch yourself and then make up for it. I had a different athlete that one time said, man, you're going to help me save my marriage because I was explaining to him that before he goes on his weekend with his boys to go race, he has flowers and a spa day ready for his wife because she's going to be home alone for the weekend. And he said, why didn't I not think to do that? I said, I don't know. Maybe you're not caring enough. Joking. You know, if your wife's watching your kids or your husband's watching your kids, while you go out and race and they're not coming with you, set up something special for them. Set up a surprise. Remind them that they are the most important thing, not the bike. The bike's crazy important. I'm not going to sit here and lie and tell you I don't love riding. I probably love riding too much, but it means nothing if the people that actually care about you aren't getting taken care of. So sorry to get all mushy, but those are important things also. So then... He said, hey, we really just need to incorporate some small tweaks here to let me to manage the mental and physical load. So I said, hey, can you tell me what did the fast talk people say? I'm actually really curious what they thought of the training. And it was great to ask that question because he sent me back one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bullet points that were sent to him. They had a phone conversation and wrapped up with um, with like an overview and the things that they highlighted, I'm going to run through these, not to pat myself on the back, but because the decision, they call them decisions, what they included, I think are good to hear. And then also ways that you can compare your old training versus your new training. So this coach said the progressive build over the 2021 season led to a great performance that you had at that Grand Fondo uses as a baseline for comparison because you know that it worked well. Um, but also think of how you rode so strongly, nutrition, pacing, mindset, et cetera. I love that this guy brought this up. March 2022 was a slightly more aggressive build. So this is after the break that he took. And we did hit a peak CTL of about 96 TSS a day, which is 10 more than the year before. You had a lot of good, strong, specific work to prepare for the type of riding and racing you're doing. Okay, that's good. Now, the bad part, which, hey, every, I don't know what I call the bad part. I think the thing that we could tweak. Response to the training looks overwhelmingly positive overall. Just that you had that acute ATL strain from a few key workouts that might have pushed you too much into the red and caused a prolonged need for recovery. Allowing for the recovery will bring along more adaptation. Totally agree. More tempo and threshold work will increase the overall, uh, excuse me, will increase the overload and improve performance, but it comes at a higher mental and physical cost. So rest and recovery needs to be adjusted. And I would add the communication piece. And I'm not pointing a finger at my athlete. It's just as much on me. The things that I was sensing, it's hard, right? I'm the coach. I am, I'm, having the psych degree, I want to like get in. I'm very, I'm an open book. If you know me, if you follow me on Instagram, like I'll share almost anything. There's some pieces of my life that I don't share, but 95%, it's mostly things in the past I don't share. And I understand that everybody doesn't want to do that. And everybody doesn't want to tell me about stress with work and things, arguments they might get in with their spouse or financial stress, whatever. If you are stressed and you aren't feeling like, ah, I get to go ride my bike. And you're thinking, God, I got to go do these damn workouts to train. Like we're talking about before you're two totally different people. And I, I should have maybe said that, Hey, would you be willing to share more about the stress in your life? Let's compare to previous years. He just seemed a little bit more distracted and not in a great way. That's on me. I should have said something. So 
there's four decisions that this coach recommended, and I really like them. And kudos to these guys for doing this. This is very similar to our power file analysis plug. If you want us to help you all like this, this is what we do. And I, the other coaches have been doing a phenomenal job of taking the lead on these. And I get emails from athletes that are like, yo, coach X, Y, and Z just did this. I can't believe you guys do this for free. Uh, so shout out to the Evo coaches. I, you know, if they want to be a coach with us, I say, hey, you got to do some free work to help the community. And we're not martyrs, but we are athletes. And I think this type of service is, we do this for free. <laughs> you don't have to be a member. This guy is a member, so whatever. It's He, he got it and that's good. Decisions. Rest week should include less work and more rest to better accommodate the steeper ramp in a training load. I'm on board with that. Um, sometimes on Fridays, I would let him do a tempo ride. Mm, that was maybe too much. Decision. Consider the transition week that we talked about every eight to 12 weeks. So you can mentally and physically step away from the training. Still exercise, ride, et cetera, but just get away from structure. I'm on board with that. Let's do that. Decision. Last 10 weeks before the big event, aim to reduce the tempo to about 10% of power distribution, opening up a little bit more zone one and two time. This will allow for less overall strain, except for the key workouts where you'll maximize strain. So he actually uh, recommended threshold intervals one to two times per week to specifically work on five to 10 minute power, just but you just need to work on that with as little added tempo strain as possible. Um, for this athlete, yes, I like that. We did do some tempo and we did some like mountain climbing simulations, just cl climbing. I mean, dude, it's 16,000 feet in a bike ride. It's crazy. I need to do that with you, Landry, in North Carolina. Um, variety, everybody still got to do some VO2 max, do the over-unders, do the intervals that this coach is talking about. An athlete like this is going to perform 95% of the time. That's a made up number, a very large percentage of the time from a very diet of training. Last decision. And this is what I love. Always look at your workouts and ask why, what's the purpose of this session? Make sure you can answer that. Sometimes you'll find you don't have a great answer and that's okay. It might be, I just want to go spin on my bike. That's a great answer too. It, do, it doesn't always have to be about a physiological response. If it's an intense workout, you might think, you might rethink the exact session if you can't answer the why. Dude, I love this. This was a great PFA. If this somehow gets back to the coach, hit us up if you're ever looking for a new gig. We know Fast Talk is a big name, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. I uh, really appreciate them doing this. And I appreciate my athletes sharing this with me. And it really felt good to have some validation and just saying, hey, these are some things we can tweak. I have no problem talk. I've coached people for a really long time. I've put out a blog about a cyclocross master's racer. It came down to communication, but also we didn't have enough intensity when we compared previous years. I wrote a whole blog on that. I'm okay in sharing when I don't hit a home run because for the number of events that we prepare for, there are some that go awry. And I think it's important to, you know, if I'm going to post all these podcasts about athletes crushing and doing well and blah, 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 let's highlight some of these that we can take so much from this communication, how to line up the workouts, looking at the big picture, getting granular enough. And so I went and I looked at the tempo time while you can't compare apples to apples exactly because he rode more this year. So like the absolute numbers aren't uh, there. He had a higher percentage in zone one in 2021. He had a higher percentage in zone two in 2022, which is good, more quality time, but he did have about nine hours more. And this is in the 10 weeks before both events. He had nine hours more of tempo and he did have about, uh, I'm looking off a graph chart here. It's about maybe three hours more of threshold. And then the zone five and six are very similar. So hundred percent, this guy nailed it. Maybe we just tempoed him out a little bit and I need to hear that. Um, tempo is a great ride. You can do too much of it. Even looking at the raw numbers is good because even when I look back at the calendar, it wasn't, it didn't seem like too many tempo workouts, but then, you know, you got those rides where you ride in endurance and you're riding tempo. You're right. And I thought I'd be riding more tempo in North Carolina. I posted a whole video on that and it turned out that I wasn't. So I think sometimes the, you got to look at the numbers. You can't always just go by your feeling. 
the feel, and I'm saying, go by your feelings. <laughs> I'm like, by the feeling of what you're riding at the intensity. It's like, Oh, I think I was riding more tempo. That's not, I don't think that's a great way to do it. You, I would find it very hard for any athlete to look at a 10 week period and compare like, Maybe you could think of threshold workouts, but tempo creeps in on endurance rides unless you're in a very flat area. Um, I think if you're comparing tempo or endurance time, just go very quickly, look in training peaks, or whatever software you use and, and compare the times. So all of this said, a very interesting thing came up. So we're, so this is this, like, hey man, this has been such a good process. Like I appreciate, you know, working through this with you he had a big gravel race come up this past weekend another 10-hour event um and so we're trucking forward he's got a massive event coming later in the year and he had said in his gravel comment i should actually pull it up and read it real quickly it's 200k and he says blah 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 my gravel bike has a nice one-to-one -one low gear that really helps on those long climbs. This is the one I rode at the Grand Fondo in 2021. It's two Ks heavier, two kgs heavier, but the gearing is much better for long, grueling climbs. And I'm like, wait a minute, he rode a different bike? Wait, what are you talking about? He rode a different bike. So I go back and I'm comparing these bikes. So I never even thought about this, the cadence. Cadence, I often let fall where it falls, right? But cadence is quite a telltale sign on a seven hour bike ride. Looking back at training rides, I'm like, okay, what's his norm when he's just going out and doing these climbing intervals? About 72, 82, very normal, right? A little torquey, but not too torquey, but he's not a super spinner. Go back and look at the, on the same bike in 2021, average cadence on the climbs, 80 RPMs. Average cadence on the road bike this year, 66, 66, go climb 16, 15,000 feet at 66 RPM average for the most part. That's the average. So that means we're going below that. Sure, we're going above it as well. That to me, what I have in North Carolina, I forgot, if you're out following me on Strava, I forgot the 28 cassette two weeks ago when I'm this like blur of the past 10 weeks of my life and I was climbing in the 25. I was like, wow, this is so much more difficult. I have the 28 and I'm just like flying up hills. So much less fatiguing. So that is a huge piece. And I'll end it on this because I know we're coming up on 30 minutes. You're probably not even gonna get to this point of video, but what a massive difference that makes. So that's one reason why you gotta get, get granular on the data. Look at everything, look at eating, look at cadence, look at the equipment, look at the sleep, look at the stress, look at the whole picture. I'm pumped to see this athlete continue to grow. You hit a wall sometimes. You hit a bad event. Make yourself better from it. You can do that. I hope people listen to this one. If you enjoyed this, please share it with somebody because it's kind of a foo-foo E1, like these um, soft skills. That's what's going to make you a winner. Uh, so wish everybody luck at Amateur Nationals this week. I'm excited. And it's going to be a ridiculously hard race and share this like this, help us out. And if you need help, hit us up. Talk to you guys soon. See ya.